Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, might be a few more folks joining us. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Todd Samsel. I'm the president of the Friends of Virgin Islands National Park. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, as we celebrate Ocean Week. Um, we have a series of seminars this week uh, with some fabulous speakers. And uh, today we're thrilled to have Dr. Marilyn Brandt uh, from the Univers University of Virgin Islands uh, here to tell us more about uh, what's going on with our corals, um, our corals in crisis, and our, our focus right now on dealing with stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, amongst, other, uh, amongst other threats that our corals face. Uh, we've, we've heard from Dr. Brandt in the past on a variety of topics, and uh, we're thrilled to, have, uh, thrilled to have her joining us today. Um, Dr. Brandt, I'm going to allow you to um, to share your screen. Um, okay. You should be able to do that, and I will turn it over to you. We will okay. have time for questions and answers uh, after the presentation, and these uh, presentations are recorded. So thank you. Okay, it's still saying that the host disabled participant screen sharing. Turn okay, well, let me. Uh... <clears throat> There you go. How's that? I got it. There we go. Okay. Can you see my presentation okay? We can. All right. I'm going to put it in presentation mode. Well, thank you <clears throat> um, for the opportunity to present. Sorry, my, I was in a couple of meetings before that and my I haven't been talking to many people lately, so <laughs> um, my voice is a little strained, but um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to give this presentation about corals in crisis. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, at first about uh, what corals are and some stressors that they're facing, in particular, stony coral tissue loss disease. And then I'm gonna get into our um, coral restoration program here in the US Virgin Islands, which I haven't talked too much about in the past, but we're really trying to ramp it up to um, as, a, as a way to respond to some of these crises. So um, again, my name is Marilyn Brandt and I'm a research associate professor at the University of the Virgin Islands. Um, I'm also the director of the Virgin Islands uh, Reef Response Program, which is a coral restoration program. Um, I'm based in St. Thomas. So I've been here for um, close to 11 years now, but been doing research in the Virgin Islands for more like 15 years. Um, and so my research is mainly focused on coral diseases, but I've been getting into coral restoration in recent years. Uh, so probably if you're interested in this talk, some of this uh, first part of my talk is gonna be um, not news to you, but because I'm gonna go a little bit over what corals are and uh, that'll become important um, later on. So corals, um, as many people, I get asked a lot, well, aren't corals plants? Aren't they rocks? Are they animals? Well, they're kind of all three, but at their foundation, corals are in fact animals. There's the coral animal, uh, but they're very special animals because their bodies are what build the reef. So that's why we call them coral reefs. So you can kind of think of a coral reef as a city and the corals themselves as the foundational buildings of that city. So that city wouldn't exist without those buildings. Um, and the, the city is built and lived in by coral animals. So if you look at an individual coral, we call them coral colonies because when you're looking at an individual coral, like a brain coral, you're not just looking at one individual, you're actually looking at tens to hundreds to thousands even of individuals that are clustered together. So you could think of it as when you're looking at a coral colony, you're looking at basically an apartment building and each of those apartments is, um, housing an animal that happens to be genetically identical to the animal next door to it is the animal next door to that. So in each apartment are these genetically identical, what we call polyps. So just a little bit of coral anatomy here. Um, here's a close up of a coral, hopefully you can see my um, cursor. And some of these coral polyps are closed. So usually you see them closed during the day. If you go out at night, you'll often see the coral polyps open. And that's when you can see their little mouths and the tentacles surrounding those mouths. So each of these mouths is, an anim is a coral animal um, or what we call a coral polyp. And this is the anatomy of it. 
right? So a coral polyp is basically a stomach um, surrounded by tentacles. And don't worry about all the technical words on here, but um, that's the most important part. So this should look a little familiar if you're not familiar with corals. Um, so when I give talks about corals, like in the mainland, um, I often have to say, well, this is, this is familiar, this should look familiar to you, or that structure sh should look familiar to you, um, the stomach with tentacles surrounding it, because if you flip it over, it should look to you like a jellyfish. And corals and jellyfish are actually very closely related. They're, called, they're both cnidarians, meaning they both have stinging cells um, called nidae. So corals don't have very strong stinging cells. So that's why if you touch a coral, you don't feel it like when a jellyfish stings you. Not that you should be touching corals, but that's just the way they are. So corals and jellyfish share a lot of characteristics, uh, but they're also very different in a couple of very important ways. So corals are colonial polyps. So whereas a jellyfish is one individual, corals are colonial. So they, so basically you have one individual and then it, and it buds off and creates others. And that's how it eventually forms that coral colony. Um, all of those little polyps are connected by a common tissue in between the individual polyps. <clears throat> and most importantly, these polyps all together build a common skeleton. So <clears throat> corals, are incredibly diverse. They come in many different growth forms. So we have um, more than 60 species of reef building corals in the US Virgin Islands and in the Caribbean. So you'll see some that are massive corals, branching corals, foliate, what we call foliaceous corals, um, some columnar corals like the pillar coral. So they come in all different shapes and sizes and some types of corals can actually come in two different shapes. So there are some massive corals that will often, when you get them deeper, will kind of plate out and into plating corals. But at their foundation, they are all these collections of coral polyps and collections of coral polyp animals. So there are other corals that don't build a skeleton, but the ones that, we're that I'm most interested in are the reef building corals. So the ones that do build the skeleton. And so over generations and generations of corals growing and living, um, and new corals coming in and growing, they build the actual coral reef structure, the foundation of the reef. So why can they build a skeleton and things like jellyfish don't have a skeleton? Well, corals build a skeleton because they have a very special relationship with a plant. And that's sometimes why they're referred to as plants. They have this support from what I like to call their roommates. So in their tissues, actually in the lowest layer of their tissues, they house a symbiont community. So symbiont meaning, meaning they're in symbiosis, they live together, they benefit each other. So there's these plants that live in the tissue of the coral and they are referred to as zooxanthellae, they're microscopic. So this is a microscope picture of some zooxanthellae. They're these single celled algae or plants um, that live in the tissue of the corals. And just like any plant, these plants are use the light to photosynthesize to create sugars. And that extra sugar boost, that extra nutrition from these algae is what allows the coral to build a skeleton. And in return, the corals give these algae a nice place to live and give them all of their products and things like that too. So those, that relationship, that little, that relationship between this algae and the coral animal, um, is the foundation for coral reefs. It's what allows the corals the extra nutrition to build the skeletons and consequently the reef. And it's really, this is kind of, the, or this is the main reason why I became a coral scientist because I just think that's just so amazing that this, this relationship between these two organisms is the foundation of coral reefs. So obviously we think of coral reefs um, as these incredibly diverse habitats. They also, coral reefs build islands, they build habitat. So, um, this is a picture of the Great Barrier Reef. Also down um, on the lower part is a picture of Little Cayman Island and the Cayman Islands. And the Cayman Islands actually wouldn't really, they wouldn't exist without reef building corals. Um, that the, the building of the reef is, over generations and generations is what formed that island. So coral reefs are also amazingly the only biologically produced structure that's visible from space. So this is really impressive. It's a picture of Belize. It's a part of the Mesoamerican barrier reef system. Um, so they're really amazing ecosystems. 
So corals are often referred to as ecosystem engineers since they build the ecosystem. Without them, you wouldn't have coral reefs. Just like without trees, you wouldn't have rainforests. And coral reefs are often referred to as the rainforests of the sea because they're so incredibly diverse. And in fact, in some cases, they're more diverse than rainforests. So coral reefs occupy only 0.2% of the ocean floor, but they're home to more than a quarter of marine life, of all marine life. And that's astounding, really. Um, also, even though they occupy such a small amount, they provide habitat for a third of all marine fishes. So they're really Im incredibly important ecosystems throughout the world. Um, there's a lot of coral reef benefits. Many of you probably know a lot of these, but I'm just going to emphasize them again. Um, one of the first benefits that people don't think about, usually the first, uh, the first benefit, as the first benefit, is shoreline protection. So again, some of these islands are built by coral reefs. And the Virgin Islands are islands aren't built by coral reefs, but they are in many cases protected by coral reefs. So this is Christiansted Harbor, and you can see the fringing reef offshore that's protecting that harbor. And actually there was an evaluation done um, and the annual, annual flood protection value of coral reefs to the US Virgin Islands was estimated at $25 million. So these coral reefs have um, an incredible value to us as protective um, of our shorelines. But also more people think about benefits from coral reefs as things like habitat for fish um, and other organisms we like to eat like lobster. Um, but also coral reefs are very diverse and so they have a lot of interesting chemical properties, um, organisms that have different defenses that um, have been mined for medicinal uses. So there are some enzymes that were actually um, derived from corals that are used to treat asthma and arthritis. Um, there's some uh, chemicals derived from coral reef organisms like sea squirts that you only find on coral reefs um, that have been used to treat things like cancers. So there's, there's a lot of value in coral reefs that we still aren't even sure of yet because it hasn't been mined. And then of course, in the Virgin Islands, coral reefs are incredibly important for tourism. They're a big draw and attraction, but also for locals because we like to play around on coral reefs too. So why are we losing our coral reefs? Um, I'm here to tell you that it's not just one thing. Um, it's not just any coral tissue loss disease, which I will get to. Um, it's not just uh, coastal development. It's, it's basically a combination of multiple stressors. Coral reefs are very resilient um, ecosystems. They've, they've withstood many stressors throughout you know, generations and generations. But the problem is today they're experiencing so much stress that they're not able to recover from stressful events. So if you think about a coral reef, probably the, your, your favorite coral reef is one where there's very clear water, um, where it's dominated by corals and fish, where you don't see a lot of seaweeds and things like that. And that's because coral reefs grow in areas where there's clear water. So because their algae roommates need that clear water for the sun. And that clear water is an indication that there's not a lot of nutrients in the water either. When you don't have a high visibility, when you, when you can't see very far, that means there's usually a lot of nutrients in the water. And those nutrients can help seaweeds grow. So areas in the tropics where there aren't coral reefs are usually high in nutrients. And that's usually where there's large amounts of seaweed, or in some cases like kelp forests where there's plants are the, the basis of the ecosystem. But in coral reefs, corals are the basis and there should not be a lot of seaweeds and there should be very good visibility. So as you change that, you change, um, as you, you can add stressors to a coral reef that are changing those characteristics. So one of the, the primary stressors to coral reefs in recent times is the loss of um, organisms on the reef that help to keep the seaweeds back, that help to mow the lawn of the coral reefs, so to speak. So those are things like parrotfish, which are also beautiful to see, um, and I know also delicious, but they're really critically important to the health of coral reefs because they keep the seaweeds down. Also important are things like these long spine sea urchins, um, which are kind of scary to look at, but they're really important at keeping the seaweeds down. Unfortunately, over time, there's been a lot of cases of overfishing of these important organisms like parrotfish. And in the case of long, long spine sea urchin, we've had die-offs of these, um, one in particular in, in the early 80s, 
and that this species is still recovering from. So when you remove these lawn mowers from the reef and then you add to the reef a bunch of extra nutrients from things like runoff, uh, from uncleared land, or from, sorry, from cleared lands, from leaky septic systems, from just trash and pollution, when you combine those two stressors together, then you start to get a situation where a coral reef is no longer a clear, uh, beautiful environment. You're, you're adding nutrients and you're giving an advantage to the seaweeds to overgrow the corals. So that what's happened, especially in the Caribbean, is that that's happened at the same time and you've gotten these shifts from coral dominated coral reefs to algae or seaweed dominated coral reefs, which are no longer coral reefs. So if you don't have coral reefs, you don't have those uh, benefits of coral reefs as you shift um, to these algae or seaweed dominated reefs. Um, and this is definitely happening in the Virgin Islands. This is a picture of Megan's Bay Reef, which has been a reef that's uh, we've been monitoring for some time that's been in some critical condition. Um, the water quality there is often like this, where you have very little visibility. The green water indicates that there's a lot of nutrients there. We've done some um, sampling for, for indicators of human fecal matter, and it's, it's not pretty. I would not go diving there with open cuts um, at this Megan's Bay Reef area. I'm not saying Megan's Bay where everybody goes to the beach. Um, this is farther out into the bay at the reef level. But so these, these changes, they're stressing coral reefs and they're changing them from coral dominated to seaweed dominated. So on top of those local stressors, so those are some stressors that we could potentially control. We can control fishing, we can um, control putting nutrients into an environment, but at the same time we're living, you know, in, on planet earth where temperatures are warming and that's really not in debate. Um, and we're seeing this in corals. So Coral, that relationship between the coral and the algae is actually really fussy. <laughs> so if you take that relationship and you heat it up a little bit, like say the air conditioning breaks on a, in an apartment with um, a couple of roommates, well, they'll start fighting maybe, you know, it could get really dramatic. So same thing with the coral, the relationship between it and that algae that lives in its tissue, those plants that live in its tissue breaks down when you add heat stress. And we're seeing this more and more year to year. So what happens when that relationship breaks down is not that the coral animal dies right away, but it, it leads to a phenomenon called bleaching. The algae in the coral's tissue is what gives it its color. So when they lose that algae, when that relationship breaks down, the algae either goes away or the coral actually in some cases eats the algae, um, you can then see straight through the coral animal to its skeleton. And so it appears bright white. And this is an incredibly stressful state for the coral because it really needs that, that algae roommate to provide that extra nutrition. So this is a state that I like to equate to kind of like a really high fever. So it may not kill the coral, but it can if you have a high fever for a really long time, right? So if a coral is bleached for a long time, it can just directly die. It also makes it more susceptible to things like diseases. So a coral can recover from bleaching if the temperature stress is removed. But in some cases, it leaves it open. It's now in a more vulnerable state because it's been through a very stressful situation. So this is happening more and more, and it in fact just happened last year, and we're seeing another case of it this year, which is unusual to have it back to back years. So this was Brewers Bay off of the university um, in November, 2019. So all of these corals are bleached. We had one of the hottest years on record last year. We're aiming to have another hot year this year. And so we're seeing some bleaching again this year. It doesn't seem to be quite as severe. So the temperatures qu aren't quite that bad, but it is still, distressing to see because this means the corals are under a lot of stress. So add on top of that. <laughs> so these are the things that we were dealing with before. And now we've had the emergence of stony coral tissue loss disease. So I've been studying diseases for um, a couple of decades now. And I can say that this disease, stony coral tissue loss disease is one of the most virulent and scary diseases I've encountered in my career. So stony coral tissue loss disease emerged in the Virgin Islands in um, we, we pinpoint it to January of 2019. What is this disease? Well, it's new. It first emerged in Florida. So these are just some news reports from Florida and we believe it emerged around 2014. Um, it emerged around the port of Miami. So this is uh, Miami-Dade County, Miami 
city, um, and here's the Port of Miami, where they were doing one of the largest dredging projects known um, in the United States. Um, this dredging project, so again, corals don't like a bunch of stuff in the water column, but also sediments and things like that can be potentially vectors for disease. So we're not 100, scientists aren't 100% sure exactly where the pathogen came from, but it did coincide with this dredging project, which also coincided with, um, sorry, two back-to-back -back years of mass bleaching events in South Florida. So temperature stress led to back-to-back -back years of corals being stressed out, and then you add this dredging project. And then this highly virulent disease emerged in 2014. And that disease, unlike many other disease, coral diseases, which tend to burn out after a season or they, they're related to warmer temperatures, this one just seems to keep going. So this was the spatial distribution in 2014. And then you can see the red is where the disease is present and the green is where it hasn't reached. And so over the course of the last several years, this disease has progressed across the Florida reef track all the way down to Key West. And it's actually, this was from 2019, it's actually past Key West at this point. Um, so it's a very devastating disease. Florida is throwing a lot of resources at it. What happened here? Well, we had been hearing about, I had been hearing about the disease at conferences um, and was concerned that it might show up in the Virgin Islands, but didn't really expect it to because we weren't, we're not in close proximity to Florida. But in January of 2019, um, I was, uh, my, our dive safety officer, Steve Prosterman, took his dive class to uh, a popular site called Flat Key, so off of St. Thomas. And he called me and let me know that he saw something weird. So we went back the next day. Um, and it was very distressing. So this is a video of that dive um, or from part of that dive. Hopefully you can see it, it may not play. Uh, hmm. Okay, well, this, I'm not sure why it's not playing. The, um, this video just basically shows a whole bunch of white patches on the reef. And that's, this picture is what it looks like on a coral. So that white, Unlike bleaching, the white on this coral is actually where the tissue, the coral animal has died and is gone. And so the white quickly transforms into sort of this green gray and becomes overgrown by algae. So the coral, the white in these instances is where the coral has died. And now at Flat Key, we started documenting the changes from the coral disease. And even within um, the first seven months, there was a loss of half of all coral at Flat Key. And we've been continuing to track that and the amount of coral left at Flat Key is only around 5%. So it, this is a very devastating disease. It's now spread all the way around St. Thomas to St. John and into the British Virgin Islands. I'll show you maps of that um, in just a little bit. But it's really quite devastating. One of the devastating aspects of stony coral tissue loss disease is that it affects so many types of coral. So as I mentioned, there's more than 60 types of coral in the Caribbean and in the Virgin Islands. And this disease affects at least 22 of them, if not more, because we're now documenting more species affected than known. So this is a, an affected list from the original case description from the disease. But you can see all these different types of coral and all the white patches on them where basically the tissue is liquefying off of the coral. So this disease is very serious. Um, it's it's, it's very concerning and it's happening on top of all of these other stressors. So as part of the territory, um, I've been very proud of the response to the coral disease in the territory. There are now, um, even after just a year and a half, there are now strike teams on all three islands, including St. John. That strike team is helping um, be led by uh, the group CORE. Um, and these strike teams are going out and helping to treat corals to, uh, because you can treat some of these corals by antibiotic antibiotics. We're attempting to um, use methods that have been successful in some cases in Florida to try to stop the disease, but it is a relentless disease. So it just continues to go and it's causing the death of quite a few corals um, to some reefs that were already under great stress. So as a response to this disease, we've also really tried to ramp up our coral restoration program. So corals have some unique characteristics to them that make it possible to try to proliferate them 
um, back into the environment. So corals, the way they, again, they're animals. So the way they reproduce is they can reproduce sexually. So that means you have a coral organism that releases gametes into the water, like sperm and eggs. Um, those combined become little larvae and those larvae settle into little baby recruits that then grow into the adults. So that's the normal way that we think of reproducing, right? Sexual recruitment um, or sexual reproduction. But corals also re can reproduce asexually. As I mentioned before, they're clonal. So if you break off a piece of them here, that piece has genetically identical polyps to the rest of the coral, but it can, um, and that breakage can be caused by, you know, storms and other factors like anchoring. And so natural factors like storms, but other factors, non-natural, like humans stepping on the coral and boats anchoring. And then that fragment will drop to the substrate. And in ideal cases, it will attach and then grow into another coral. So then you'll have two genetically identical corals sitting next to each other or nearby. Now, this is all an ideal scenario. What we're finding is that all of those stressors I mentioned before are leading to this, this transition not happening very often, where the fragments fall, but they don't reattach, or if they reattach, they're so small and they're just up against so many stressors that they don't, they don't manage to make it to adulthood. So we, however, as a, uh, in the scientific community um, and coral restoration practitioners, I'm trying to, to take advantage of the fact that corals will reproduce asexually, um, that they will do this. So we, we take advantage of these, what we call fragments of opportunity, and we try to give them a little boost. So coral gardening is a technique that's now been around for a couple of decades, but it's really expanded in the last decade or so. And that's where you take these little pieces that fall, maybe due to a boat grounding, maybe due to just storms, and you bring them into a nursery. Now, remember that these pieces are coming from corals that are still living, that are living in these environments and have already put up with so many stressors. So we know that they're pretty resilient. We then bring those little pieces into these, these like coral farms um, and we attach them onto, um, this is what's called a tree, a coral tree. So these are PVC trees um, and fishing wire and you attach the coral in these tiny little pieces and they eventually grow into much bigger pieces. So once a coral grows bigger, a couple of things happen. One, it's able to fight off predators better or, or withstand predation better. And also a coral won't reproduce sexually until it gets to a large enough size. So what we do is we let them grow out in this kind of peaceful environment with no coral predators, with no seaweeds, and then we plant them back onto the reef. And there's a lot of different ways, not just cor with coral trees, but people have invented different uh, ways of coral gardening. So there's these table tops. Um, there's just different types of structures. So here in the Virgin Islands, um, oh, sorry. So before I get to that, so then after they grow out, when they're big enough to survive on their own, we plant them back, plant, quote unquote, plant them back on the reef. And that usually involves putting the corals out with either some epoxy or some concrete, um, or even just trying to shove them into the reef. And then, then they take it from there. And so this is a picture of a site um, where this was done. This is Fragments of Hope, which is a group in Belize, and they've been incredibly successful at restoring reefs. And so this is a picture of that reef uh, about five to six years later, where they've been planting corals, um, doing a lot of work, and the corals have kind of taken off and, and taken over by themselves. Now they're a healthy ecosystem um, supporting fish. So it's back to what it should be, right? So again, you're doing this with resilient species. So in the US Virgin Islands, the Nature Conservancy actually started putting in these coral gardens or these coral nurseries um, to do coral gardening around the territory. They have um, several nurseries in St. Croix, which is where the Nature Conservancy tends to operate from, um, but they also implemented two nurseries in St. Thomas, so West Key and Flat Key. Um, they were established in 2009. At each site, there's about 20 anchors for these trees. We got involved as a university um, by, uh, I got personally involved by advising master's students who were doing a coral reef restoration internship with the Nature Conservancy. So when they'd come over to St. Thomas to maintain the coral nurseries or to do outplanting, uh, I would, you know, these graduate students would get training in that. 
So between 2014 and 2016, the Nature Conservancy, with help from UVI students, outplanted over 11,000 staghorn corals around St. Thomas. Now, staghorn coral is one particular type of coral. It's this coral here you see our student um, Kyle planting, and it grows very quickly. It does really well in in-water nurseries, these, these nurseries with the trees, um, and then you can plant it out. In 2017, in early 2017, the Nature Conservancy um, had reduced their staff, so they really couldn't take care of the Northern Virgin Islands nurseries any longer, so they transferred them to UVI in January of 2017. We all know what happened in January, or in later in 2017. Uh, we got hit by a couple of, you know, storms. And unfortunately, the nurseries took a big hit. So we had, uh, we learned some things from those storms. One, that these tree nurseries, they do okay, um, but you really need to be out planting all the time. Um, and maybe have some different types of structures besides just the trees. We also learned that the staghorn coral does not do very well through these storms. So we really wanted to diversify our species and our nurseries, and especially where the nurseries were placed. Uh, I was fortunate to have two interns working that year with me, two Master of Marine Environmental Science um, student interns, Alex Gutting um, and Kristen Ewan. And they've now uh, graduated. Kristen works for the National Park Service on St. Croix. And Alex is actually the Coral Restoration Coordinator for the Nature Conservancy on St. Croix also. Um, but they helped uh, to bring back the Flat Key Nursery um, almost single-handedly. Um, these women did some incredible work. They also helped to start um, what we have is a citizen science program called VI Reef Response, which now is the term that we use for the whole coral restoration program. And this is where we have local divers come out on dive shop boats um, sponsored by dive shops to help maintain the nurseries because we realized we just didn't have enough personnel, like relying only on the grad students who are fantastic. We just can't keep up on it. So we really need help from the public to do that. So we have this thriving VI reef response program. So we were able to bring back the flat key nursery. Um, and actually we started to install new nurseries. So, um, we have here, this is an installation of a new nursery at Great St. James, uh, where again, we're putting in trees, but because we think the trees can do well in this scenario. Um, but we've also established a relationship with the Lavango uh, Resort and Beach Club that's uh, under development at Lavango Key, where we're hoping to put in um, tabletop nurseries. So again, this is a different type of nursery structure, but we're hoping it, it'll be very effective over there that can serve sort of the Northern part of the Virgin Islands a little bit better. Um, so, we're, so we've installed the nursery at Great St. James and we're hoping to install the Lavango nursery in December or January. Um, also what we've been done is put in a land-based nursery at UVI Marine Science. So the staghorn corals do very well in these in-water nurseries and so do some other species. And some of the massive coral species, the ones that are being now affected by the stony coral tissue loss disease, they don't do so well in those types of nurseries. So we started constructing a land-based nursery in 2019 uh, with funding for personnel and for supplies from the Sperance Foundation and an anonymous donor. Uh, and we were originally focused on three different types of coral that were not staghorn coral, um, but we've actually expanded that now um, due to the outbreak of stony coral tissue loss disease to try to incorporate more species that we wouldn't have targeted before or more types of coral. So this is what it looks like. Um, UVI Marine Science Center is under construction. If you didn't know, our center kind of blew away in Hurricane Irma. So uh, in the meantime, we've constructed uh, in between containers, the, the seawater system has been reconstructed and this is where our nursery is. So you can see there's many different types of coral, including um, pillar corals and brain corals in this nursery. And the technique we're using there is called microfragmentation. So a couple of things that I've mentioned already are that, you know, corals, when they're tiny, um, they don't do so well in the environment. They can be eaten, they can, overgrow, or they can be overgrown easily. And so when they're small, corals really put all of their efforts into growth. So because they, so they don't reproduce when they're small, um, because they're really just trying to grow as quickly as possible. Um, sorry. Okay. So they're, they're trying to grow as quickly as possible. So the technique microfragmentation was developed at Moat Marine Lab. And it's a technique that kind of harnesses that, that aspect of corals. And this is a technique that works really well with mounding corals. 
So what the process is, is you take a coral, you know, that might be small, it might be a fragment of opportunity, and you use a tile saw to saw it into tiny little fragments. You then clean those fragments really well and you glue it onto a plug. And then you, you abrade every part of the edge of it and you turn it into these tiny little pieces. And that actually allows more surface area for a coral to grow. So if you think of a coral, here's a picture of a coral, and these slides are courtesy of my grad student, Dan Mealy, who's also a photographer. So he has incredible photography of corals. Um, and he does great work with microfragmentation. So this would be a coral and you, corals usually only grow at their edges. So if you think of this coral, as it grows, massive corals take a long time to grow. But if you split this coral up into little pieces, you then have it growing at each of those edges. And it, so it's gonna grow faster overall. But yes, now it's into multiple pieces. But remember, this is a clonal organism. So if you break it into these different pieces, these are still genetically identical and they know that, so they recognize themselves. So you let them grow out like this because they're growing like crazy now because they're really tiny. So they're trying to grow really, really fast. You let them grow to a certain size and then you outplant them in what's called an array. So this is an array of a coral that was split up into little pieces. And now you plant them kind of close to each other. So now they've all grown a lot bigger, um, but through time, and, and this is another array that they planted all over this, this substrate, um, through a much shorter amount of time, because these things are genetically identical, they'll actually fuse back together. And so that fusion, you now had, you had one coral that was this big, you split it into tiny pieces and let them grow big. And now you've planted them together and they have fused together. So now you have one much bigger coral than you started with. And you've done this in a year's time, which a coral growing from this big to this big in a massive species sense would have taken um, five to 10 years. So you've really accelerated that growth. And one of the coolest parts is, is when a coral gets to a certain size, that's when it becomes reproductively active. And what they found in Florida, where they started to pioneer this, is that those corals are in fact reproducing. So this actually happened just a month ago where they went and checked on these arrays of corals that had fused back together and they are in fact spawning. And so now you've taken these small corals of fragments of Arutuni, you've made them larger, you've made them reproductively active and now they're contributing to uh, the potential sexual reproduction too. So it's really kind of a cool process. So we're doing a lot of microfragmenting in our system now with the expectation that we're doing it with corals that have survived the disease outbreak or that have survived these stressors and we're gonna be hopefully putting them back out in these arrays. Um, also, as part of the land-based nursery, we've turned that part of it into a coral rescue program. So there are certain types of corals that are really susceptible to disease and we're really focusing our efforts on trying to save those genotypes or those like individuals of those species that may disappear, may in fact disappear. One of those species is pillar coral. So pillar coral is highly susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease. So we're trying to save individuals just to make sure that we still have that species left because in the Florida Keys, in parts of the Florida Keys, pillar coral is now regionally extinct. So what we do is we bring the corals into the lab. You can see some disease corals. And this is really a lot of the effort is by um, my technician, Adam Glan, who's uh, used to work for the National Park Service on St. John, but we stole him because he's great with corals and he's been really leading these efforts um, to address stony coral tissue loss disease in the lab. So what we do is we amputate the lesions off. Again, the coral is clonal so that if you keep some of his tissue, it'll keep growing. And this is a coral where we amputated the lesions off and the disease, we put it in clean water and the disease has stopped. And so this is a very healthy coral. We've actually now fragmented this coral to try to make it grow bigger. And we know now, um, you know, this, this coral has, we've saved its individual, we've saved its genotype. So the coral rescue program is a way to try to save corals from stony coral tissue loss disease. The whole restoration program is a way to try to restore some of these reefs. We can't put, or we're not at this moment putting highly susceptible species back out, outplanting them, um, but we are looking to do that very soon and are trying to find strategies where they'll survive. 
So the coral outplanting from this year, so this is the first year that we were actually able to outplant corals since Hurricane Irma. We've gotten to a level where we're producing corals and we can start outplanting. Fortunately, COVID had some impacts on our diving operations. So we've only been able to really outplant at three locations on St. Thomas. And we do have plans to outplant um, when the temperatures uh, go down again in December at Lavango. Um, and so this is what that looks like. We're putting out staghorn corals and we're really monitoring their growth to make sure that you know, these guys survive um, and are contributing to the regrowth of these reefs. So our ultimate goal is you know, to try to stop stony coral tissue loss disease, but we know this disease, they have not been able to stop it in Florida. So we know there's gonna be a lot of loss from it. We're trying to stem it. But what we ultimately want to do is go back and try to replenish these reefs as quickly as we can. So our goal is to bring back these reefs, make them healthy, um, and have them be be produce or be structured by resilient corals. Our obstacles is this continued spread of stony coral tissue loss disease. This is just a um, a GIF of the spread of stony coral tissue loss disease throughout the ter territory from January. Um, and I think this, this animation goes to 2020. I'll show you the website where you can see some of our, our tracking, but the disease is really all the way around St. Thomas now. It's to St. John and to the British Virgin Islands. And it actually did just show up in St. Croix about a month ago, or no, actually a few months ago now. So that's a major obstacle. So we really need people's help. <laughs> so we, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work um, trying to, to track and stem the tide of stony coral tissue loss disease. There's a lot of people doing a lot of work in coral restoration, um, but right now we need anybody's help that we can get. So if you're a snorkeler or a diver, um, if you have a reef that you go to very often, we're trying to track how the disease is moving and how sustained it is at certain sites. So you can go to our website, vicoraldisease.org um, and report any sightings of odd things. And you can see there's a button in the upper right corner where you can report your sightings. You can put a little pin on a map of where you were. If you take pictures, that's even better. So please help us by reporting sightings. Please also help us by reporting sightings of healthy reefs, reefs where there is no weird stuff going on. We definitely would appreciate that. Um, and then the second thing, we're a little limited by COVID right now, but we do have this, still have the active VI Reef Response Citizen Science Program um, where people can come and help maintain our nurseries. So. We're launching a new website soon, but in the meantime, you can look for us on Facebook, Twitter, all the social media outlets. And um, if you like us, then you'll see announcements for when we have our next um, operations. So that's what I have. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Dr. Brand, thank you. Um, we'll definitely uh, ask folks to uh, put questions in the chat and I'll be happy to Kind of read them uh, as they come in, um, but I just wanted to say thank you uh, and thank you for ending on uh, an optimistic note. Uh, I yeah. guess I'll say uh, I've, I've I've dived with uh, the treatment uh, teams here on St. John, and I will say for an activity that I do for the enjoyment, sometimes it gets a little bit depressing. But um, but I yeah. appreciate the optimism and the the positive. Uh, work that's happening. And for folks who support the Friends, I just want to say, first of all, thank you and, and know that we have been supporting financially through CORE, uh, this partnership that's focused on, on protecting our, our coral reefs. Um, and, and we're actually, the National Park Service uh, is, is working with us to kind of put a plan in place that hopefully we'll see the potential for uh, land-based and in water coral farming happening in the future in the park. And so that's exciting to us and, and we're hoping um, that, that that will happen. So, uh, so stay tuned on that and stay engaged. Um, but first question, uh, Dr. Brandt, can you talk a little bit more about how the treatment of stony coral tissue loss disease with antibiotics works? Um, yeah, absolutely. So one of the key, one of the major issues with this disease is we still don't know what the pathogen is. And that's, coral diseases are notorious for that. Corals are very complex. Again, there's multiple types of corals, but they do, the lesions do seem to respond, meaning they stop if you put anti, if you apply antibiotics. So the treatments they developed in Florida that we're implementing here include a specific 
paste um, called base UB that you mix in amoxicillin. So that's a common antibiotic. And then you can apply that paste to the lesion edge on corals. And in, in some cases it'll stop the lesion, some cases it doesn't. So we're, we're re, sometimes you have to reapply it, but that antibiotic is really um, just limited to that paste, but the paste was specially developed for corals to have a time release aspect to it so that it'll time release the antibiotic into the coral tissue over several days. So that's the major treatment option. One of the other options that we're doing is we're culling corals. So in agriculture, culling means you sacrifice the animals that are sick, but we're not quite doing that. We're, any corals that are small aren't too affected yet. What we try to do is we, ch we literally chisel them off a reef. And that, those are the ones that we're bringing back to the land-based facility and trying to treat there to save um, because, the, and that essentially removes kind of this disease producing material um, from the reef. So we're trying to remove individuals that might be helping to spread the disease, but we're all with the intent to either try to save that individual or we are, if it does die, we are saving the skeletons to use to try to reskin with corals from our lab too. Um, and I also should, again, just emphasize that uh, this is not only an effort by my lab. There's so many groups involved. And so we really are reliant on volunteers like Todd and like, and, and just support, financial support from the friends, from um, all of these different groups for this, this response. Great. Dr. Brent, do you know, uh, do we know how the disease got here from Florida and how do we tell the difference between stony coral tissue loss disease impacts and bleaching that we see? Yeah. Well, the how did it get here is kind of the million dollar question, right? Um, it did not spread through currents. Does not seem like it spread through currents. It did just kind of randomly show up. Um, what I what the evidence points to is that uh, it was potentially ballast water discharge. Um, the sites where it showed up first are downstream of the Crown Bay Marina area, um, and we know that. Looking, at, we're working with the EPA to and the Coast Guard to look at ballast water discharge records. And we know that there was a yacht transporter that discharged water that was sourced from um, a disease area in Florida. And that was not treated along the way and they did not do a midwater exchange. Um, that coincided with, it was about a month before the disease showed up here. Um, or yeah, a month before the disease showed up at Flat Key. So we think ballast water is the most likely way that it transported. Also where it showed up in St. Croix recently, it's also been associated with harbors um, or the, uh, the lime tree facility, um, the docking area there and potential, we're looking at ballast water discharge records there. So we're pretty certain that it's shipping that is the source. Not necessarily, I know a lot of people like to point fingers at the cruise ship industry, but cruise ships don't usually do any kind of ballast water exchange in port because there's a lot of people coming on and off and that would destabilize the ship. So I don't, uh, it's unlikely that it's cruise ship. It's probably more likely shipping related. I know we have experts uh, when we asked recreational divers and snorkelers to send photos and we have experts that will take a look and kind of determine, but what, what's the, what do we generally oh, right. for the difference between bleaching and, and disease? And disease. So usually bleaching affects the whole coral. So usually when a coral is stressed enough to have temperature bleaching, the whole coral will turn white or turn pale. Um, also, if you look very closely at the coral, don't touch it, but if you look very closely at that coral, the coral animal will still be alive. So you'll still see its tissue and it'll still be cleaning itself. So there won't be any kind of like sediments or anything settling on it. When a coral is affected by stony coral tissue loss disease, the tissue has liquefied off of the coral. And so there's patches of white. It's not the whole coral's white. And those patches of white, if you look, are now, there's sediment on it and you can just, you can see the skeleton part of the coral. There's no soft, there's no soft look to it. There's no, uh, the coral animal is no longer there to keep it clean. So algae will colonize very quickly or seaweeds, baby seaweeds will. So it'll start to turn green very quickly. So it's difficult. Last fall, <laughs> it was, we had a simultaneous, stony coral tissue loss disease outbreak and bleaching event happening at the same time. And as a scientist who's been looking at these two things for 20 years, 
I was having a hard time underwater trying to distinguish if, if that's a lesion due to stony coral tissue loss disease or bleaching. Um, so we just do the best we can. If you want to submit reports, though, all we ask people to do is submit reports of if they see weird things, you don't have to be an expert. Um, submit pictures and then we will send people out there, part, you know, the strike teams out to go check it out and make more determinations because we really have to look at all the types of corals, who's affected. And sometimes we have to go back repeatedly to see, is this really stony coral tissue loss disease, like the beginnings of it, or is it something else? And this is not the only disease impacting our corals. So in addition to no. skittle and, and bleaching, we see other diseases that like are banned. Difficult. My plague. Yeah. So the disease I'd worked on up until now, really, I'd focus my efforts on white plague, a disease called white plague, which is very similar to stony coral tissue loss disease, but it's not as virulent. So that's the one where people will send me a picture and is like, is this it? And I'm, and I always insist. I have to say, can you go back out and take another picture of that coral in a week? <laughs> because if it's dead, then it's it. But if it's not dead or you know it's slowed down, then it might be white plague. Because a lot of times corals don't die from white plague. But but yeah, it's been confusing. But we're I think we really have a, a an incredibly coordinated effort. I mean, if you think about it took Florida like two to three years to even figure out that this was something new and to really mount a response. Whereas in the Virgin Islands, I mean, within a few months, we had a coordinated response. We had people going out and starting to do treating. Um, so I'm really proud of what's happened here in the Virgin Islands. Great. I'm going to save this next question from Stephen for the summary question. Uh, jump down. You mentioned um, how the broken pieces are attracted to other coral of the same gene pool. How do you match different pieces of coral together? Do you know you do a lot of genetic analysis to determine um, whether they're a match or is it just kind of hit or miss or are there better coral genes to cultivate or, or not? There's a lot in Well, there. yeah, no, no, it's a great question. These are great questions. So for the fragments of opportunity, the ones that we're going out into the field and collecting from say boat groundings or something like that, we, we don't know who's related to who. Um, so that takes some genetic sampling. Um, and we're not often trying to put those genotypes together to fuse back together. If that happens, that's great. But we're usually, we usually like take those individuals and then break them up more and then put them back together later on. Um, same thing within the lab. We're usually starting with a coral and we, we cut it up and then we label them so that we can keep track of who's who. So when we go put them out into these arrays, we know who is who. But it's difficult because the genetic analysis is also sometimes not fine scale enough. Like if you're talking about fragments of opportunity from the same reef, um, they may all be really closely related. You know, it may be like kind of brothers and sisters. So you may not even be able to tell who's who. Um, but we, we basically, we have a really good system of tracking a fragment once it comes in and what happens to it after that. Uh, when it first comes in, it's just hard to, to say who's who. Right. You mentioned transplanting some of the corals uh, that you've been growing in the nursery back into the ocean. Will you, will you keep an inventory of corals at the nurseries in case the disease hits those sites and you have to come back later? Yeah, absolutely. So we have anything that we outplant, we're going to keep at least a couple of fragments of back in the nursery on land. I think speaking of on land, we're also running out of space. Um, we're really limited right now because of the reconstruction of the Marine Science Center. When that's done, we can expand a little bit more, but we've developed a relationship with Coral World. Um, Logan Williams, who is running there, they, they have also, they started a, a coral restoration program. Uh, we're working closely with her. She was actually one of my grad students. Um, and she's doing a lot of the treatment work at Koki Beach for the stony coral tissue loss disease. But we now have a relationship where when we have overflow of corals um, coming in and being treated, they are setting up a restoration or a rescue exhibit where those corals are gonna be going. So not only, because we lost a lot of corals in the hurricanes too at the facility uh, because of the damage to the Marine Science Center. So now we're, we're just, not only will we have backups at UVI, but we should have a backup at Coral World as well as in the, in the actual ocean. And we're also hoping that we have enough fragments that we wouldn't just be putting everybody at one site. We would be distributing those genotypes around. Okay. Um, 
Did you have a did you have an end slide there that had uh, appropriate web website I, information I on? I did. Yeah, let me I can, can put that up for a second. Yeah. So, well, there's the VI coral disease site, which is um, so VI coral disease.org. So that's where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about stony coral tissue loss disease in the Virgin Islands. And we also have links to a lot of other websites in the Caribbean um, and in Florida about the disease. And then the last slide is um, for our VI Reef Response Program. So right now the VI Reef Response Program is being hosted by the Virgin Islands EPSCOR program, but we're about to launch our own website, which we will absolutely put on Facebook when we do that. Um, and Twitter and um, Instagram. So if you find VI Reef Response on the social media and you like us or you become, you know, you look for us there, you can see our announcements about it. Great, thank you. Um, and somebody was asking you about the recording uh, of this. And yeah, the, the Friends, Friends of Virgin Islands National Park will have uh, our entire series this week of seminar uh, recordings available on our website. I would just give us a day or two after the last one, which is tomorrow, and we'll get all the recordings up on our website. Um, so you'll be able to get that. Are there any other questions before I kind of do the last one and summarize for Dr. Brandt? This has been a fabulous presentation and, and I definitely can't thank you enough. Um, well, I so absolutely appreciate the opportunity to highlight these issues. And 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 our programs. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a great program, and we're we're definitely thrilled to support you um, and and your students and, and interns. So so Stephen asked, what's the best way, in summary, um, to support uh, the great work that you're doing? Well, you know, first of all, attending things like this is very helpful because you can learn more information and pass it on to people. Um, you know, I'm I'm hoping that knowledge about stony coral tissue loss disease, but also about the coral restoration program. Uh, we need people to be aware of these issues, aware of the other stressors that are affecting coral reefs. So there's a lot of things people can do in their daily lives to just help corals, um, you know, using reusable container, you know, reducing your impact on the environment is going to help corals. Because like I said, it's not just one thing or another. It's not just stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, it's not just bleaching, it's these local impacts too. So becoming aware of your impact on the reefs and, and trying to reduce your impact on the reefs is gonna be helpful. Um, other things that we really critically need are those reports of disease in the water, um, but also reports of healthy coral reefs. So sites of hope. <laughs> we wanna know about those locations because there may be something going on at those sites that is preventing the disease from getting there or being severely affected there. Um, and then again, we're gonna need actual manpower for the VI Reef Response Program and maintaining our nurseries um, and outplanting. And so um, getting involved that way when we, when we can restart after COVID, whenever that happens, um, after we can start doing more of the citizen science actions. Um, that's helpful, but also financial support to our program, but to the Friends of the Virgin Islands National Park who are supporting our programs in turn. Um, that is all uh, also probably the number one thing to do. So. Yeah, we are. We're, we're certainly proud to support the partnership. We have uh, we have a fundraising goal of about forty thousand dollars this year that is directly supporting the dive teams that are are hitting the water uh, around St. John in the National Park. And so um, so we're thrilled to be part of that. And that's that's and fantastic. And you guys are making an impact. I know I said that the it doesn't always work the antibiotic application, but I can tell when when the crew has been at a site, when we go to monitor um, or to assess the disease levels, I can see corals that have been treated and the lesions have stopped. And so that's a coral that's there for future generations that's still large enough to contribute to new corals. So, you know, I can't thank those groups enough. Yeah, they're doing a fantastic job. Well, Dr. Brandt, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, folks that joined us, thank you. And uh, this will certainly be available 
um, recorded and uh, please share it uh, uh, when we get it available. And um, we look forward to uh, to the next time we can get together, Dr. Brandt. Um, thank you for yep. the work that you're doing for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. yep. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye. Okay. Thank Bye. You.